Welcome everyone to this new episode of the Inclusive Travel Masterclasses. Uh, we're here with Rebecca McGuinness, who's Senior Managing Educator uh, in Charge of Accessibility at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Hello, Rebecca, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good afternoon. Great, and welcome to all our participants. Um, we are glad that there's people joining in from, from all over the world. And um, it's great to see all the, the, the interest for this, this wonderful lesson that Rebecca is going to do, uh, which is part of a general project of um, these, um, this series of webinars aimed at um, giving professionals in the tourism and the cultural sector as well, the, um, the tools to, to, to implement new and more inclusive practices within their, um, their activity. The idea is to learn from experience, from the direct experience of those who have been doing, um, uh, have been doing this or are um, doing it currently. And we have learned so far um, about many subjects, but today with Rebecca, we're going to see the wonderful experience that, um, that she and her team are carrying out at the Metropolitan in New York. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's it's always wonderful to have an opportunity um, to share with colleagues across the the world. Um, we have so much in common, and um, especially at this moment, it's important. I think that we, um, you know, we can spend time together and. Um, you know, share resources and learn from each other. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you later. Um, so um, I thought I would um, today focus on a few audiences um, and uh, programs that we offer at the Met um, for uh, people with disabilities. Um, he, so uh, probably uh, many of you have been to the Met before. Um, the Met is uh, located on the Upper East Side of Manhattan in Central Park, and here's an, an aerial view. Um, a, a very large encyclopedic museum covering um, you know, 5,000 years of, of art from across the world. Um, and so uh, also um, the, the Met, um, has a very long history. We're celebrating our 150th anniversary uh, this year. Um, the, the day, the birthday was actually last month in April. Um, and um, the history of accessibility and access programming at the Met is, is also quite long. Um, we um, offer, offered accessibility uh, physical accessibility, um, things like wheelchairs for people to borrow and accessible entrances um, well over 100 years ago. Um, and there were uh, programs certainly for people who are blind and deaf people, uh, people with physical disabilities from um, the first decade of the 20th century at least and here there's an image of a group of um, school students uh, who are wheelchair users in in the Met from I believe this image is from the 1920s and on the right this is a picture of, of a photo of Helen Keller touching a, a, a cast um, from the Met. The history of accessibility and programming for disabled visitors really kind of picked up in the 1970s, 1980s. A touch collection was established and we began um, having uh, deaf uh, guides to uh, give tours, give highlights tours in American Sign Language. We established the first ongoing program that I'll talk a little bit more about called Discoveries, um, which is for children and adults with developmental disabilities and autism. Um, then um, other scheduled programs for people who are blind or partially sighted, um, people with dementia developed in the, the, the latter decades of the 20th century. Um, and today, uh, we, we work a lot more today um, on accessibility throughout the museum in addition to 
programs that are specifically tailored to um, meet the needs of people with disabilities. We work with um, educators who develop programs for all audiences to help them design the programs inclusively from the start. Um, and then to also to help designers um, and others in the museum to create spaces and um, interpretation and exhibitions that are inclusive. Um, and, and here there, there are two images actually of um, uh, different types of programs happening. On the left, uh, an art making program in American Sign Language um, led by deaf educator and teaching artist. And on the right, um, a, a touch tour focusing on um, dogs at work and play in the collection for um, service animals and their humans, uh, led by uh, one of our educators who is um, who is blind and has hearing loss and has a service animal. Um, so I've I've uh, already mentioned um, really the the things that we we do developing these tailored programs, um, advising others on inclusive programming and accommodations and acting as sort of internal advisors across the museum on accessibility and inclusion. So I'll focus first on audiences with dementia and their care partners. Um, this is an audience that we've been uh, really focusing on a lot in recent years. Um, as you, you probably know, the numbers of uh, people with various types of dementia um, are ever increasing as the population ages and um, family member and professional care partners, of course, are also living with and affected by um, dementia. And so we have a very large audience there. Um, we work with this audience in a number of different ways. We have a scheduled program called Metascapes. We have partnerships with uh, various types of organizations. Um, we do programming in the museum and off-site at other locations for um, these audiences by request. We host a support group in the museum for people who are uh, recently diagnosed with dementia and they use art to um, discuss the changes that are occurring in their lives, really. Um, we also collaborate with an organization that, that grew out of um, our programming called Arts and Minds. Um, we host uh, programs that they offer. They have a, a Spanish language um, uh, program for this audience uh, that takes place at the Met. And we collaborate on, on various uh, programming initiatives, research initiatives to widen our, our audience and uh, reach a, a broader range of, of people with dementia. And we also have and are actually developing right now um, many more online um, and on-site resources to support independent visits or use of our website. Um, so I'll uh, just talk a little bit about Metascapes. Um, Metascapes has been going, let's see, for 12 or 13 years now. Um, it's a program that individuals um, at, with their care partners sign up for. Um, we, under normal circumstances, have about uh, 26 programs per year, once every uh, couple of weeks. The program is free, but we ask people to, to register. Um, and there are three different formats. We, the majority are, are gallery tours. And then we also have some of the programs um, in the studio, their art making workshops. And then we use our touch collection, which is a collection of mainly accessioned objects um, that uh, were, the, the collection was established for people um, who are blind or partially sighted back in the 1970s, but we use it more with this audience now. It's a way where that we can um, let have people engage with with works of art, but in a classroom in a quieter setting, um, without having to move around the museum. As you probably know, um, we we know that uh, social, cognitive, and physical stimulation all um, help to sort of stave off the um, the effects of dementia, and so we're, we've we've 
thought very carefully about how uh, programming and resources can um, touch on these um, these different aspects of activity, um, and uh, we're interested in um, affecting positively people's mood, stress level, um, um, for the care partners as well. Um, we think we we think a lot about caregiver burden and how the experience in the museum with a person. Um, being cared for with dementia um, can really be a positive, um, generative, rewarding experience for, for, for everyone. So the goals really uh, of the program are to improve the quality of life for both the people with dementia and their caregivers, to provide these opportunities for cognitive, cognitive physical and social stimulation, and also to reduce caregiver burden, isolation, and stress by fostering communication and comfort. So just a few uh, images to um, give you a sense of, of what happens. So here in the galleries, we think that small groups are, are really um, important to the success of the, the program. So we try to have um, maybe six to eight people total with each educator. So we have multiple educators at each, uh, at each program and then we break into smaller groups. Um, the, the, the tours are very much dialogues based in observation. So we're asking people what's in front of them, not asking them to remember things. There are um, activities that engage various senses uh, throughout these tours, including sketching, handling materials, sometimes scent, um, movement even. And I'll just read a quote from a, a participant. Um, they say, it gets us out of the house and into a nice environment. People remember him and he smiles. And another caregiver said, it's really nice for my mom to have something to look forward to. We put it on the calendar and she's so excited that she's gonna visit the Met. The social aspect is very important, another said. Being engaged in a small group, it's not a lecture, it's relevant and personable. And here's an image from the, the second type of, uh, second format for Metascapes, art making workshops in the studio. One care partner said, it's a way to participate with Jay, to have a shared activity. So everyone participates, not just the person with dementia. We use music a lot in these programs uh, in different ways. Um, music uh, remains very, um, a kind of a very strong memory for uh, people with dementia often and um, singing is very popular if it's a, if it's if it's anyone's birthday we might sing that here we had um, we actually had a jazz trio um, playing in the middle of the studio while we were looking at art related to music and um, and and making art so um, the the musicians were actually improvising to the art on the screen uh, from the collection but also um, going back and forth you know we invited people to make art in response to what they were hearing um, but uh, then the musicians looked at some of the works that participants were making and improvised music based on what they saw in the art. So, um, you know, playing with music has been very fruitful for this audience. It's another art making workshop. We have adaptive art supplies to help participants who may have reduced dexterity or other kinds of mobility or other difficulties in participating in art making. Um, and then here's the third um, format, exploring works of art through touch um, in our touch collection. And that also involves sketching, um, you know, touch, a lot of discussion and close looking. So when we evaluated the program, um, caregivers mentioned how much they enjoyed the program, the importance um, for them of seeing the person that they care for engaged during the program, um, 
also that shared opportunity for um, experiences, you know, experiencing art together with the person with dementia. So having something to talk about that's sort of outside of the everyday, that social experience, meeting other participants as well. People often um, come early and, and have coffee together or stay after the program um, with other, you know, other families and um, um, care, caregivers and their, um, the person they care for. Um, and uh, having something to look forward to was a big um, draw. So um, in, in this time when the museum has been closed, um, we closed on March 13th, um, we have uh, continued Metascapes virtually. Um, so uh, it's not gonna be exactly the same, right? Um, using Zoom um, is challenging for, well, for everybody at some point, but um, for this audience in particular, but um, we felt it was really important to maintain connection, um, understanding that people with dementia and, and caregivers are, you know, particularly vulnerable and isolated right now. So just just being there um, and, you know, having a bit of fun together and looking at some art um, is, is really important. So that, that social component, um, you know, is, is something that we've really been conscious of maintaining. And then the, the looking at art, you know, moving from the galleries to uh, the, 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 the screen space, we can look at details, um, which, you know, in some ways is easier than, than it is when you're in the galleries. We can compare objects um, that we couldn't compare uh, maybe next to each other uh, in the galleries and just look closely. And, uh, you know, we're having the same kind of conversations um, based on observations. Um, that we might have in the galleries. And this is just a, an example from a wrap-up activity um, where we uh, invited people in advance, people who are registered to come prepared with hats and scarves and other things that they could use to um, kind of change their appearance to disguise themselves, if you like, inspired by the head coverings and the costumes in Georges de la Tour's The Fortune Teller, which was one of the works of art that um, they were exploring in this, earlier in the program. So the program ended with this bit of fun at the end. I think you can see by the, the looks on people's faces that they were enjoying themselves. Um, we also launched, um, a new program uh, in April um, that's been only online. We had planned to launch a memory cafe um, in, in the museum in the spring, um, uh, just a, um, an opportunity for people with dementia and their care partners to come together in a less formal environment, still surrounded by art or inspired by art, but to, to, to just share resources, to chat, to have a cup of tea together. Um, in the, the way we originally planned it was they'd be in the museum. Um, they could um, then uh, take advantage of, of the resources for self-guided visits that we were planning simultaneously. Um, but we decided that, especially right now, because it's we felt we felt again it was really important to maintain that social connection with this audience. Um, um, we decided to go ahead and launch virtually. So we've been um, offering this experience, um, the virtual memory cafe, uh, once a month, um, and uh, it. We we use. Um, art as a sort of springboard to conversation, but we also do other things. We always have some stretching, <laughs> a little bit of exercise, get the blood flowing. Um, we get everyone set up and chat. Um, we, we, we introduce a theme um, based on something in the Met uh, or your, the Met itself. Um, this first program we did was uh, during the Mets, the, the, the 150th anniversary week. So we were talking uh, about um, 
collections and histories and stories. So collecting stories was the theme. And we asked people who were registered to um, bring with them an object that was meaningful to them that they have collected or you know has come into their possession and, and be ready to tell a story about it, um, just as museums tell stories about their uh, collections. So um, here we have an example of that where um, the, um, the two people, mother and daughter, on the left and in the middle are showing a, a photograph from the uh, older woman's childhood and they're talking about that and you see the, you know, the green edge around um, the participant in the bottom row, he's, you know, responding and they're talking back and forth. And we, we felt that this is really, this is really exciting and important that people are communicating across boxes, you know, they're, they're talking to each other on Zoom. And this pr participant um, also was just, um, he, he couldn't believe that he actually made it onto Zoom, you know, um, and just the fact several people have said, you know, just the fact that we're all here together is just incredible. And, you know, I, people kind of felt proud of themselves for, for connecting in this way. So we're really pleased at how this, um, this is working out. For um, people with um, developmental disabilities and autism, we, uh, we also have a suite of programs and resources um, and uh, they include schedule programs, programs that are uh, by request. We partner with various organizations, group homes, day hab programs. Um, we have sensory friendly resources that people can borrow in the museum and that are available online. Um, the discoveries program is um, a, a, the program that I mentioned earlier for um, people, uh, well, there are two separate programs, one for children, five to 17, plus friends and family. And um, the other is for ages 18 and up, plus friends and family. It takes place on one Sunday a month. Um, uh, it did before, um, before the days of, of COVID-19. Um, and uh, the workshop is always on a, a particular theme, starts with, um, an introduction in the studio, then a gallery tour with lots of multi-sensory engagement. Everyone participates. Um, we have multiple educators, so groups are again small. Then we come back to the studio for a related art making project. And um, again, this the social aspect here is really important, the community building, um, but also skill building. Um, you know, we're, we're um, in, instructing and um, quite open-ended, but, but still art making activities that have, um, you know, are, are exploring various materials and various ideas. Um, and uh, also we're looking at art and discussing art together. So there, there's definitely skill building there in the, the kind of social and even problem solving observation um, areas. Here's some images of some movement, um, showing off art making, um, and here are some of the multi-sensory kinds of um, activities. Some tactile materials, again, um, moving uh, to understand a work of art and art making there in the bottom right. Um, and I mentioned that Discoveries is our longest running uh, program for people with disabilities. Um, it uh, turned 30 a few years ago. I think we're probably 33 now, uh, 32 maybe. Um, and so here are some, uh, just some images that are fun from uh, decades gone by. Uh, we have uh, participants who are um, coming back again and again. Um, this is a participant whose name is Rintaro. He, um, he started as a young child, but in the left, there's an image of him as a teenager from 2008, and on the right, um, 2018, so 10 years later, um, he was participating. He um, uh, made this, uh, image on the bottom, happy 30th anniversary to uh, Discoveries, you know, in honor of the 30th anniversary of the program a few years ago. 
Um, and Rintaro actually, uh, he's a very talented artist, as you can see. He has a, a degree from the School of Visual Arts, a bachelor's degree. Um, and he's now, um, we've now employed him as a studio assistant. Um, and he's also taught a few programs or co-taught them with our teaching artists. So, um, you know, that, that sense of community and uh, long, long-standing participation is very, um, is very uh, important for us to build. Um, however, I also wanted to mention that we, we also encourage participants to take part in programs for any audience. It's not that people with disabilities are only participating in a program like Discoveries. Um, families who come to Discoveries also participate in teen sketching, in our career labs for teens, in family programs, come to story time. So um, people are, you know, uh, engaging with the museum in various ways. And here, um, just an example um, of a digital resource. We um, want to kind of document the experiences of people with disabilities and represent the experience of disability um, through, uh, throughout the museum. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. But one of the things we, we, um, we did here, there's a, a MET uh, website called MET Kids. Um, and here our um, former, um, Chair of Education, Sandra Jackson Dumont, interviewed two of the um, artists who had uh, works of art in the exhibition we held to celebrate Discoveries at 30. So you can find that on um, the Met Kids um, website. And I, as I mentioned before, we have um, sensory friendly resources in the museum that can be borrowed, things like fidgets um, and um, um, a weighted blanket, timers. We have a kit that people can pick up in the, in, in the library. There are quiet spaces during uh, large events. Um, and online, we have things like a sensory friendly map that indicates um, spaces that are that tend to be crowded, spaces where there's natural light, things like that. Um, so uh, virtually, uh, we have also um, wanted to maintain our connection with this audience. Um, we couldn't really exactly translate the Discoveries workshop into a virtual format. So what we decided to do was to send out um, the week before um, a, a virtual event, um, a, a, an activity, an art making prompt um, related to a particular theme. Um, and that includes um, examples from the Met collection, um, also being quite open ended because people, we don't know what materials people have at home. Um, and we send that to people who are registered. We also share it on our Facebook page. Um, they access at the Metropolitan Museum. Facebook page. Um, and then uh, the, the next week, we all get together on Zoom and um, we invite people to send us images of their creations. Um, and then we compile a PowerPoint and we, um, we discuss the works of art that participants have made. So we have a, we do a group for kids and a group for, for adults. Um, and uh, but we've done it. Let's see. I guess we've done it three times now, uh, four maybe four times um, since the museum has been closed. And um, it's been uh, I think it's been a really good way to maintain connection um, and to continue empowering participants to you know be creative and. Um, use their ingenuity using objects that they have at home to think in different ways and new ways about a theme. Um, so we, we're really trying to um, maintain um, those skills and also maintain social connections with others. For people who are blind or uh, partially sighted, um, we 
have also a, a suite of uh, scheduled programs. Uh, there's one called Picture This, and there's a drawing class called Seeing Through Drawing. Um, also by request, touch tours, um, descriptive tours, which we call verbal imaging tours, um, um, various, various offerings um, that involve um, handling materials to help people understand how an object is made, um, touching uh, works of art in the galleries, using touch as um, a stimulus for or an inspiration for drawing and seeing through drawing and also using description, using imagination, using sound um, as the inspiration for drawing as well. Um, we use tactile graphics there in the top left. Um, this is a, a, a raised line drawing of, um, of, of, a, of some tattoos um, that uh, one of our um, artist in residence who was from uh, Samoa um, made for us to explain, um, to help explain what the tattoos were were like and um, then she explained what they meant to her and that was during a program in our um, Oceania galleries where we also had the curator um, of Oceanic art um, talking about the collection and we had objects that could be touched from our touch collection from the from the area so um, we're we're touching we're smelling we're drawing um, uh, we also use music. There's an image here of um, a concert. This is our partnership that's gone on for what, 20 year, 21 years, 22 years, with um, um, a community music school in New York. So virtually, uh, we're um, we're still connecting with this audience. Um, we focused our first uh, virtual picture this on, again, on this exhibition, Making the Met, celebrating the Met's 150th anniversary, um, where we uh, described um, some of the uh, works of art in the exhibition that were significant to the history of the museum. Um, and then we also showed some images from past programs to kind of um, talk about how participants are part of the history of the Met as well. And then most recently, last week, we had um, the gardeners from the Met Cloisters, which is our um, uh, uh, one of the three Met sites, um, which is uh, made up of um, cloisters and um, other buildings, um, chapels, and um, that are uh, from mainly from Spain and France that were um, disassembled um, in the 1920s and moved here brick by brick and uh, reassembled up in Fort Tryon Park um, in a beautiful spot. Um, and it houses much of the Metz collection of medieval art. Um, and the gardens there um, are um, are very beautiful. There are several different types of garden, um, and here we um, we have the, uh, the, the the famous unicorn tapestries. We had um, uh, an educator from the cloisters talking about the unicorn tapestry, and here I've shown a detail of how we're using Zoom and you know, outlining um, things to help people uh, locate them and see them better, people with partial sight. And then the, the gardeners from the cloisters, two of the gardeners were, were with us as well. And they were um, talking about uh, flowers that were currently in bloom, are currently in bloom, um, that are actually in the unicorn tapestries. Um, they, uh, they, they are essential workers. They're able to go and uh, you know, water and tend to the garden. So they had just taken these pictures specifically for this program um, where they had many details of different, different flowers, different plants. Um, and um, this was a, a really popular uh, experience um, with a lot of participation from um, the individuals who are blind or partially sighted who were, who were um, on the on the Zoom meeting, um, we also have uh, programs in American Sign Language, both art making and um, gallery programs, um, uh, and we were able to um, 
offer one um, tour in American Sign Language. Most of our programs are um, given in sign language by a deaf educator or teaching artist rather than interpreted, unless there's a request for interpretation. Um, we were able to do that only once um, back in March. Um, while we were able to use um, Joyce that you, you see in the, the top right of the top right image, um, uh, who's a um, one of our freelance educators who's deaf, we just shifted our scheduled um, tour of the uh, Gerhard Richter exhibition um, that's currently on in the museum, or was then, um, to a virtual format. And we actually had more participants than we normally do coming into the museum. And um, we had deaf people from all over the US and um, even from Europe uh, participating. So I'm looking forward to going back to, um, um, back to the museum, of course, but also, um, recording some of these tours and making them more widely available so that um, sign language users have access to um, the exhibitions and the collection. We do have um, a few videos online um, from a few years ago um, uh, that are in American Sign Language. We have um, had a feature a few years ago called Viewpoints, Body Language, and um, it featured uh, a number of sculptures around the museum of, of, of people. Um, and the museum invited um, people from all walks of life. Um, there were um, curators, of course, and conservators, but also um, theater producer, a neuroscientist, a, a dancer, um, uh, talking about responding to um, uh, several of their, uh, their favorite sculptures among the, the, the ones that were chosen as part of this project. And um, one of our um, freelance deaf educators, Emmanuel von Schack, who's shown here on the right. Um, he, uh, he's an art historian, he's trained as an art historian. Um, uh, and so he did, he made five of these videos about five different works of art. Um, and really here, rather than um, speaking specifically as a museum educator, he's really looking at um, the idea of gesture and body language in sculpture from the perspective of um, a, a sign language user, a visual language user. Um, so uh, they're very interesting videos. They are captioned in English and there's also a voiceover. So um, I encourage you to, to take a look at those online. There's another one. Another thing we've been um, we've been doing uh, since the museum has been closed, we've really been um, you know trying all kinds of different ways to reach out to connect to um, our regular participants, but also new participants, so or new audiences. Um, we've been uh, very active on social media. Uh, we've been posting daily on our Facebook page, sharing resources from the Met, but also from other. Um, cultural institutions, um, and we've been working with the Met's um, social media team. Um, so uh, they've been featuring accessibility and programming and disability um, stories um, there as well. So on the right, um, on one of the Throwback Thursdays on uh, Instagram, um, the Met Instagram, the the big, the big Instagram for the whole museum, um, uh, shared some pictures from you know, the 80s. I think these were from the Discoveries program. Yeah, um, as a yeah, as a Throwback Thursday feature. So please follow us on Facebook. Um, we've also been using social media to continue work on an initiative. Um, where we're, we're aiming to 
make disability more visible in the Met's collection and interpretation. So to really foreground the narratives, the stories of disability, um, for example, how um, disability can be a generative force, um, a force for creative innovation um, among um, artists with disabilities. Here's an example um, that we, we featured um, on online. Um, Camille Pizarro um, had a, a chronic eye condition and he um, had to paint indoors. He had to move to um, painting indoors. So um, he developed this technique of this sort of almost bird's eye view, looking out the window at a cityscape of Paris, while many of his, his contemporaries were out in the country and painting landscapes. And, um, you know, that's this, um, this sort of format, this, um, this subject um, became very, very popular. Um, and it was really um, instigated because of his eye condition. So there are many examples like that where we're trying to um, switch the narrative to, to um, not have disability as, uh, not think of disability as um, deficit, but to think of it as um, a creative force. So we're using social media um, and programming to continue this work um, that we're doing in collaboration with disability studies scholars and, and um, disability artists as well. So I want to stop in just a minute um, and uh, kind of learn, hear from you um, and uh, answer any questions. But I, I thought it might be helpful to have um, some information about a few great professional development opportunities that you might not be aware of. Um, a conference that, that I attend every year, um, it's just such a great um, opportunity to meet with accessibility colleagues, um, which we don't get to do often enough, right, um, is the, the Leadership Exchange in Arts and Disability, or LEAD conference, which is organized by the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. Um, it takes place every year in August, but unfortunately it's been canceled this year, um, and it's in different cities around the U.S. Um, so you can find information about it um, on the Kennedy Center website if you Google this, this title. Um, uh, and then uh, there's also um, a conference really that is a spinoff of LEAD um, organized by Arts and Disability Ireland um, called From Access to Inclusion, an Arts and Culture Summit that's taking place. It was meant to be this month in Dublin and it's going to be uh, next year in March. Um, and then a couple of um, accessibility professional organizations in the US for cultural professionals that you may or may not be aware of. Um, and just one recommended blog, The Inclusium, which is um, a really interesting um, look at diversity, inclusion, and accessibility in a, a museum context. So um, thank you, I'm gonna stop there. My contact information is here, my, my email, um, if uh, anyone would like to follow up, I'm happy to, happy to be in touch with you. We have some messages in the meantime, we have from Panama, from Ana Maria, who runs a travel, travel, accessible travel agency in Panama. Great information and greetings. And we already had a couple of questions that I collected okay. in the meantime. Uh, one, uh, two actually from uh, Jessica, who's from Italy, where she is the director of the um, foundation for the Giuseppe Verdi uh, Foundation. Oh. And, um, uh, and she's also curator of an ethnographic museum. She's asking, um, how do you manage the training 
of your staff and how also do you um, how do you train them how do you select them because you mentioned that uh, you had one very active participant who also who's also now uh, um, a collaborator but how do you select and how do you train your staff mm -hmm. yes we have about um, 20 um, contract educators and teaching artists so they are um, um, you know, freelance um, educators and, and artists, and um, most of them also teach in other areas of uh, of education at the Met and and often at, at other museums as well. So some of them we you know recruited internally, um, and um, others we we just done a. Um, last fall, we did a, a call out. We, we needed more um, educators for our programming for people with dementia, and so we um, we you know invited people to um, to get in touch. And we also went to our museum colleagues around the city and asked them um, for recommendations and things like that. We were looking for. Um, Additional educators, especially who had other language skills, um, uh, so um, people tend to come to to us, and then we um, we sort of um, audition. You know, people um, uh, do a demo for us, a teaching demo, um, and then for for training, we we do a lot of. Um, Kind of individual mentoring, shadowing, co-teaching at the start. If we're not bringing on a whole group, a new group of educators, in um, this new group that that came on um, uh, in 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 the autumn, we we worked with um, the organization Arts and Minds. We we joined forces to to do that because we both needed new educators. So that was a great way to. Um, get, uh, you know, find more people uh, by, by joining forces, but also to train them together. So we had a nice, you know, group of people that we could develop um, training for. Um, so um, that's, you know, we, we did have a, a training, um, two half day trainings actually, where we, um, we used the intro training for the new people who hadn't worked so much with people with dementia. Um, we had a, um, a neurologist who works with Arts and Minds and with us in um, studying the impact of, of arts programs. He spoke about dementia, so there was, a, it was kind of a refresher for people who knew, but you know, new for, for others. Um, and then we talked about teaching strategies and adapting them. Um, so uh, the training was for new people and then also um, the second part was for everyone. So kind of a refresher, a way for people to share their expertise with newer people. Um, and uh, so that's the most recent sort of training and recruiting initiative that we've done. Um, we also periodically have training in um, other skills, for example, um, describing works of art to people who are blind or partially sighted. Um, we also uh, recently did a refresher and object handling um, for, for educators who lead our, um, you know, touch tours and um, touch collection workshops. So we had a um, um, collections manager from our Department of Europe in sculpture and decorative arts um, to come and do that training for us where we um, we made you know all of our um, educators and staff access staff participated um, so um, we just you know have various initiatives various um, types of training um, focus uh, on different kinds of training for different audiences at different points um, you know throughout the year and sort of ongoing professional development Okay, thank you. And uh, you said you had 20 freelance collaborators. You, you call them, sorry, their name is Cyan. Yes, uh, contract educators. Contract teaching educators, artists. okay. Yeah. Do you yeah. also have about, volunteers? Yes, yeah, so we, we have about 30 volunteers, um, but we, 
we don't use the volunteers to teach or to lead the programs. Um, however, their participation is, is crucial. It's so important um, because they're helping to support the educator, the program leader. Um, they're helping set up art supplies. They're helping to guide a blind person or to push someone's wheelchair. They're helping to get the assistive listening devices um, ready for everyone um, at the beginning of a program, a tour, say, um, you know, they're checking them, they're making sure everyone's on the right channel, you know, they're carrying our drawing materials in the galleries, helping to um, pass around handling materials and supporting individuals one-to-one -one where needed. So um, they work as a, a team really with the, the educator or teaching artist. Um, so yes, we have about, about 30 volunteers um, about 20 of these uh, like freelancers. And then um, in the staff team, um, we have five right now. Um, we have two, there are two educators, myself and one other. Um, we have a, a program coordinator, sort of and the main administrator. And then we have a, a, a one-year paid intern who, unfortunately, is finishing next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, then we also have um, a, a, a two-year position, um, another administrative position that's supported by um, our, um, we got a, a grant from the Mellon Foundation, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, um, to augment our programming and services and outreach to people with dementia. So that position is mostly funded by that, um, that grant for two years. So, um, yeah. We'll be back to three <laughs> before too long. So you're not looking for another intern just to know if we can share the job posting. <laughs> well, we, unfortunately, we won't be in the coming year because of the financial situation um, as a result of the, the pandemic. But in the following year, uh, I, I hope we will resume that. Yes. And I'll share it with you and you can pass it around. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I have a question regarding, oh, there was another question from, oh, it's from Jessica, who asks, are the virtual activities for free, the ones you've been yes. doing? Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. Um, our uh, programs in the museum are free and mostly uh, also include museum admission. Um, and we, uh, we haven't charged anything for the uh, virtual programs. Um, nor has uh, any other part of the museum education department. You know, there, there are lots of um, other online resources for any audience, and all of those are available for free right now. Oh, this is wonderful. It's really great. Um, I have a, no, a personal question regarding the... Um, well, first of all, saying that these virtual activities um, that you're doing are great. And these are one of those things that smaller museums can also implement uh, really easily also for the future, because mm -hmm. um, I know that the cost of many things has gone down. And one of the things that is really affordable now is a, is a license for, a, you know, a, um, com online conferencing service. Mm -hmm. so, and it, they're becoming easier to use. So it's something that anybody can really try out. I think the, the, the nice, you've been doing some things that are really nice. The ideas are super nice and they're super creative. And I think this is one of the things that people could do uh, already very easily in their own um, museum, even if they have a, a smaller budget and less, uh, and less mm -hmm. stuff. And um, one, one question that I have is what would be your advice for smaller museums who want to start implementing a series of um, more inclusive activities. But my question is, what, what is your personal advice on how to create activities that they can keep up in time? Because often what, what we see is that maybe there is an initiative that is temporary, um, mm -hmm. it happens once, they, they manage to, to keep it up for, a month maybe a season but then it becomes difficult to keep up what would be your tips to to help things stick <laughs> yes yes no that's a that's a very good uh, very good point a very good question um i think um building in um a, a mindset around inclusion um to whatever kind of programming 
um, is 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 being planned is is one way of sustaining that inclusion. You know, just bake it in, <laughs> you know, as we say. You know, um, I, I sometimes say, you know, accessibility or an inclusion is not the icing on the cake; it's the eggs in the cake. So you can't remove it. You know, you can't just slice it off the top or leave it out. It's integral, um, and that goes for you know budgeting and um, time it takes to plan things, um, and it, it's kind of a really a shift in thinking. I think we just think, okay, this is going to, you know, for uh, this video that we're putting online, it has to be captioned. So. Um, that's not something that we think, oh no, I've done this video, now I have to caption it. How am I going to do that? It's all, you know, that's just part of the, you know, the post production that you, you know, you have to do other kinds of post production, right? So it's just built in, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging. I know. <laughs> but um, I think that's the first thing. Um, and um, I think connecting with, um, organizations and aud connecting with audiences with disabilities to get feedback to um, you know know that you have an, an audience and one that's willing to um, give you feedback and to tell you um, what worked what didn't what you might want instead and just keep keep reminding you in a way that's another way to to, to kind of sustain the the work um, so those are a couple of really very basic um, foundational things to focus on. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I had another question. Arts and Minds, you said it's a spin-off of, of your department or yeah. the museum. How, how did that yes. happen? So Arts and Minds um, it was started by one of our contract educators, our freelance educators, Carolyn Help and Healy. Um, and the way it happened was um, that uh, we, we get a lot of observers, a lot of uh, professionals from and students from various um, disciplines who want to come and see the program. And um, quite early on, um, I think in 2008, um, uh, a young neurologist who worked at Harlem Hospital um, asked to come and observe Metascapes, and we we um, we put him with Carolyn, who had, with one of you know we we divide into lots of groups as I mentioned, and so he went with Carolyn, and um, they um, they began talking. He was really interested in the potential um, impact of of arts programming, and you know the benefits for um, both person with dementia and the caregiver, and he. Um, so t together they started, you know, they put their heads together. He, he was, as I say, then at Harlem Hospital um, and uh, really wanted to focus on the local community and, um, you know, access to such programming there. So um, it's predominantly African-American um, community and often the resources are not, um, are not available and, um, there's sometimes, you know, psychological barrier as well for people, you know, coming to places like the Met, unfortunately. And so um, he and Carolyn started Arts and Minds um, uh, with a focus on um, serving audiences in northern Manhattan, so um, underserved populations. Um, and uh, he's now at Columbia. Medical Center and Columbia University, which is also even further up in <laughs> in Manhattan, um, uh, and we all continue to collaborate and um, work on, as I said, kind of studying the impact together and training together, and um, yeah. But that's really so. You know, Arts and Minds they work a lot with the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, they work with El Museo del Barrio, um, where they also have the, um, um, once a month they have a Spanish language program for people with dementia there, and once a month at the Met. Um, so um, they work in various museums. They don't have, you know, one site. They, they move around and they have, um, you know, different types of similar kinds of, of programming, um, with art making, with looking at art, um, 
yeah. But we we're always um, looking at, you know, it's a, that's a small organization, and we also share some educators, but we have different strengths and you know different weaknesses. Being a tiny organization and then a huge museum, and so mm -hmm. it means we can pool our our resources, not just financial ones, but you know our the things that we are we can do, um, and reach a, a wider uh, group of of people. So. Oh, um, that's interesting. No, I was rather curious of the how of the whole story and how it came to be. And um, I, I have a practical question about um, adaptive arts supplies. Mm -hmm. Where can you buy them? What uh, can you give us maybe a couple of things that you use a lot and that you would mm -hmm. recommend um, other museums to 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 stock up right yes i mean some of them are very easy um and and don't cost very much like uh if anyone plays tennis you have your old tennis balls you can slice them and put a paintbrush in so if you need something to grip um you can use that <laughs> i think I, I illustrated that so that doesn't cost anything if you've got, <laughs> you've got some nice diy tips we have a separate webinar <laughs> diy tips <laughs> DIY. Um, you can um, uh, you can uh, wrap a rubber band around a pencil to differentiate it from another pencil, or you can have the rubber band um, at the grip, you know, to help people grip, but also to indicate what the pencil is. Or you can have the rubber band at the other end or in the middle to help help. Blind or partially sighted people differentiate through touch between colors, say, of colored pencils or, you know, um, um, ponte crayons or uh, whatever the material. Um, we, um, we also, we use those, you know, those bean bag um, lap desks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, to use in bed here, whatever. Um, those can be useful for wheelchair users um, as a, a, a sketching board. A drawing board um, you know they raise it up a little bit and make it a little more stable um, mm -hmm. either on on your on, on your lap in the gallery or even on the table if it needs to be higher up um, in, a, in a studio um, we for people who are blind or partially sighted we also put together a little we got those just little plastic boxes with different compartments um, so you can put uh, different drawing materials, say, of different colors and different different slots, and then we labeled the slots we, with a you know braille a brailler that you can peel and stick, um, but also with some uh, large letters um, uh, that you can stick on for people who don't read braille, so that you can differentiate between you know your different again different colors or make sure you know where your different materials are so they're organized um, and we have those available for um, seeing through drawing which is the drawing class specifically for people who are blind or partially sighted but we also have it available for drop-in drawing for example with the, which is a drop-in drawing program that happens on a friday evening um, in the museum so that uh, you know anyone who might benefit from that um, can participate more easily um, those are some of the things uh, i was expecting something super technological and uh, and complicated but no the great thing is that it's really practical things too oh, yeah yeah and, and it's not expensive so yes you can everybody can do it oh, oh. things like um um little trays and you know cartons compartment ways of cart compartmentalizing paints which you know there are different ways to do that um uh you know just things like that um okay and you have these little braille printers i i, I bought one on a kickstarter mm -hmm. which was very nice because you just compose some labels and stick them on anything and it was exactly uh, rather cheap so that was uh right yeah exactly very simple or even um we use you know puff paint or those little dots that you can stick on as well um which you know for as again for non braille readers you know one okay i know that my my charcoal is in the one dot 
compartment and my Conti crayon is in the two dot compartment or, you know, things like that. It's not fancy. <laughs> but it's practical and it's effective. And it's so uh... now one of the things I, I must say from your photos, what we really saw is like people having a lot of fun at the museum, which is really something always great to, to, to see people actually enjoying themselves and doing things that, uh, like like uh, like also sports. I I heard here in Brussels about yoga at the museum, but um, contrary to popular belief, I believe that yoga is a dangerous sport. <laughs> but it's always very nice to kind of invade the museum space and um, and appropriate the space to do some mm -hmm. some activity um, like sports or drawing and all kinds of mm -hmm. uh, kinds of things. Um, Unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is about 3D printing. Um, do you, because now it's become more, rather more affordable to mm -hmm. get objects um, 3D printed. So mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago when it was just starting, it was incredibly expensive and it seemed really mm -hmm. complicated. Now it's much easier because in many cities you have a copy shop, which uh, sometimes also has 3D printing. Um, right. Yeah. The it's idea so there where they could, people could, um, use it in uh, do you use 3d printing or you you have other we um we have just occasionally i um i try to focus on um touching original objects if we're thinking 3d printing as you know replicas of objects that that people can touch yeah. um, i think it's important um when we're offering something as a tactile material to attend, you know, very closely to the, the tactile qualities of the, the object. And if, I mean, you can now, um, in some cases, replicate or, or, or close to the, um, the material, but often the 3D printed material is nowhere nothing like the original um and so i i'm uh, i'm just um i i caution people <laughs> about that um when when i think when you when you're using touch whether it's for a blind person or for anybody to help them understand how a work of art is made or um you know just to get a, a a kind of closer sense of what an object is like, um, you know, touch is, is a very different experience from sight. And so um, it's not a replacement. And the experience of an object through touch is going to be very different, right? It's going to be sequential. Um, it's going to have to, you know, you're going to have to build up a sense of what an object feels like. Um, you're going to get different types of information about the texture, the temperature, the volume um, that you may not even be able to get from looking. And then there are things from looking that you can't get so easily from touching. So um, rather than just kind of creating a, um, a replica that actually doesn't replicate the medium, um, so you don't get that texture, that weight, that you know, sense of the physicality of the object, you, I think that sort of misses the point of a of a tactile material or tactile handling object, unless you're designing that replica to um, to talk about the shape, the form, um, you know, and and maybe you have an example of the material, you know, a piece of marble or granite that people can feel to get the, that temperature and that weight and things. Um, and for, um, for tactile graphics is another thing that people are using 3D printing for, I see. Um, and again, I think it can be, um, it can be really, um, a really great medium and very durable for, um, you know, raised maps or, you know, tactile, tactile graphics of various kinds. Um, but for ones that you're using in, in, you know, in the galleries or, um, you know, in, in programming, I think often you can just make, you know, make a, um, um, a swell paper drawing 
you know, much more cheaply <laughs> and quickly and you're, you know, easily. Um, you don't need to 3D print a tactile drawing um, if it's something simple like, um, you know, um, something that's just going to be used in programming. It doesn't need to be super, super durable. It's not outside or it's not being touched by everyone all the time. So I think there's a lot of potential, but I think we have to really be um, um, very um, intentional about how we how we think about touch and replicas and 3D printing very, you know, think about what we're trying to convey and make sure that the, um, the replica or the, the tool that we're creating is actually going to get that information across in a meaningful way. Um, and it's not just something that can replicate the visual experience of, of an object. Okay, so, no, no, this is yeah. well, no, very interesting to, to have your opinion on this because, of course, it's something that's easy and cheap to do now. But yes, is it effective? Is it a good experience? Mm. Mm, not, not quite. So, apparently, well, so, you know, uh, it can be. It can well, be. Of course, if you can touch an original with gloves, honestly, when I see the photos, it's like, wow, <laughs> that's much better, of course, to yeah, touch an original. But uh, I was just wondering about the gloves, which is something. Oh, yes. Well, many of the objects that we can touch, we don't wear, have to wear gloves for, which is really great. Um, we do have to wear gloves. Um, we don't have to wear any gloves for anything in our touch collection. Um, or the objects that are in the galleries, some of the objects that are in the galleries, the ancient, ancient Egyptian pieces, for example. There's some pieces of American decorative arts, uh, some Roman sculpture, ancient Roman sculpture. Um, we do have to wear, we, there was a, an image of a, a marble um, dog, a small dog that uh, was being touched with gloves in, in my PowerPoint, and that was a um, a special request that we made. It was a new acquisition to the museum, and um, it was the, the tour was this uh, dogs at work and play theme. Um, and so we went to the sculpture curator and asked her if we could touch it, and she was delighted. She loves dogs. She was so happy. She actually gave us the three um, D printed and then modeled like the final. Um, kind of mock-up of um, that sculpture for the touch collection because they were making a version you could buy in the shop. <laughs> so we actually have a replica, we do have a replica of that, but that was the real thing we were touching. But um, because it's this beautiful, creamy white marble, mm. we had to wear gloves to, to touch that. We also have to wear gloves to touch um, the Rodin sculptures. Uh, we have, again, very white marble and the bronze, which, you know, the, the oils from, um, from our hands would, um, would damage the surface. Um, but uh, I, you know, I always try to get objects that we don't have to wear gloves for. And if we do have to wear gloves, um, you it's, know, it's we, a minor you know it's a minor sometimes you just have to I mean like yeah. now for COVID it's yes, a, yes, yeah. yes exactly, That's exactly. How I was thinking getting used to wearing gloves and, yeah. <laughs> and masks and it's it's really weird at the beginning but you get yeah. used to it yeah you even get used to communicating with a mask with other mm -hmm. people with eye contact and very yeah. aggressive eyebrow movement. <laughs> right. I mean, that's going to be a challenge, isn't it, for people who um, have hearing loss, people who are uh, reliant on lip reading, and um, also for, for deaf people who are using sign language, you know, uh, um, the part of the, the, the language is, is actually in the, in the face. So um, it's, it's going to be challenging. Right. Oh, I can imagine. Do you do you already have protocols in place, or are you thinking about this for when the museum will open again, or um, or is we're, it too early? We're we're just starting to um, begin our planning for reopening. Um, yes, uh, really, in the last couple of weeks we've just begun to you know ask the questions, um, and um, I'm sure you know we'll need to be in touch with a lot of museums in Europe that are opening before us to learn what people are doing. But um, I've been thinking about things like uh, remote sign language interpretation, for example, where um, you know a sign language interpreter doesn't need to 
be present so that they can expose their entire face mm -hmm. um, to the uh, deaf, deaf visitor, um, uh, things like that, and how we can um, provide captioning in a more nimble way for, say, even for gallery tours remotely um, for people with hearing loss. Because I also, I'm not sure about our assistive listening devices. They, you know, require contact, mm -hmm. and so I don't know if we'll we'll be using those. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a lot of disinfecting going on here in Europe. Mm. Now that we are out yeah, of sure. here, you, that they are throwing disinfectant at you wherever <laughs> you go. <laughs> Never felt so hygienized. We're still at the, the point of finding it difficult to get the disinfectant. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> It's, it's it's all you know it's, it's uh, soon you will have it soon it's gonna happen yes. it's, everything yes. is uh, is a bit delayed uh, uh, up Your head. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question from Spain from Janja. Uh, are descriptive or Dutch tours in Spanish available for an occasional blind visitor from Spain? Thanks and regards from Barcelona. All right, uh, um, we uh, we try to make um, descriptive and touch tours available in language, other languages um, by request. Um, Spanish is, is um, our easiest one. Um, it's probably the most common um, language um, other than English that um, you know, we have available to us with the, the skills we have from uh, our educators. Um, so Spanish is often possible, I mean, French is possible. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, we have worked with, uh, we, the museum has a team of a very large volunteer organization actually that um, they have um, foreign language guides that do highlights tours in 12 different languages, I believe now. Um, and so sometimes we have worked with them and trained them um, uh, to um, give a descriptive tour or another type of tour when we've had a group or an individual request a particular uh, language for you know whatever type of, of, of tour they like. So it's possible we try and really trying to expand that uh, capability. Okay. Yes, because the multilingual is always a bit of an issue. That, that's the part that I find that museums, the smaller museums, struggle with the most because mm -hmm. they're able maybe to give um, uh, sign language tours, for example, uh, in the language of the country. Mm -hmm. But it's difficult to find, it's dif difficult to go multilingual with the accessibility components. Yes, so yes. For the subtitles, it's challenging. for the interpreter, the sign language interpreters. That's the thing I've seen that museums struggle most with. Yeah. And we, um, we, we've been expanding our partnerships uh, for people with dementia, and we really wanted to reach um, people that. Um, weren't getting so many services across the city and so um, we we were still looking for additional Spanish-speaking um, educators but we do have some um, and also Mandarin speakers, Russian speakers and um, Bangla is a, a large um, Bangladeshi population and we partner with um, a senior center that has uh, day programs for um, people with dementia. And what we've been doing is relying on their translators. Um, and they've even offered to translate some of the, on the, the, the prompts, the resources um, for art making and for um, looking at uh, works of art and talking about works of art online. Um, They've offered to take what we've done and translate them into Bangla, and I'm hoping that we can then <laughs> make them available. Um, so it's kind of an exchange, you know. We we'll, we'll give them the programs, and if they'll translate them for us. So some, I think, you know, working with organizations in the community can sometimes um, can sometimes barter for those <laughs> services. Well, that's brilliant. And that was my question actually was, but um, do associations or, you know, the community centers, the associations come to you or do you reach out depending on the project? Um, 
-hmm. what happens we do both um we have we we have a um, many of our partner organizations we have about 20 or so partner organizations maybe 22 partner organizations right now most of whom um uh, for most of whom we have uh monthly or bi-monthly um programs and many of those probably more than half of them i think are we go to them mm -hmm. uh, so we go to their site we go to the um it might be a veterans hospital or um, a children's hospital or um, a nursing home or assisted living um, or a, a, an adult daycare or a group home for people with developmental disabilities um, and then sometimes they come to us and sometimes it's a, a mixture we, you know we might alternate depending on where they are in the city and uh, what capacity they have for transportation um, the medical needs of their participants, um, all of that. So it's it's a mix, but we do have a lot of offerings that are outside the museum walls. Okay, no, no. I, I was wondering in terms of com let's say partnering up. If they, if you, um, if you receive often specific requests, for example, from associations or um, groups that have a specific need, for example, for their to, to be able to enjoy the museum or or if you um, uh, do outreach to to the associations to to offer them let's say more mm -hmm. activities again it's a mixture people come to us and uh, people uh, or organizations come to us for often one-off by request you know oh i you know run a adult day center or recreation program can you know we'd like to visit the museum or you know just people just kind of contact us to ask what we can do and we might talk through the needs um or uh in in, in some other cases we might um reach out to specific organizations definitely um it often happens that an organization that contacts us for a one-off program you know then they the relationship builds and builds and um you know might become a kind of ongoing relationship or a different kind of partnership um yeah so it's really a mixture we do try to um constantly identify new audiences and invite um organizations to to share information and resources and you know to connect with people in in different ways so that's really an ongoing <laughs> ongoing thing cool so do, do you at this point if there are no more questions from the public do you have questions for the public rebecca <laughs> Ooh. Well, well <laughs> um, gosh, <laughs> Where no, to start? in case, because we've never done this. We've always done the Q&A yeah. to the speaker. But uh, yeah, if you have any questions, we have some people from, I know, from Italy, from the museum and the touristic um, context. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, Mike, whom I know is from the museum, the Linda Museum in Stuttgart. We have um, someone from Spain. Um, it's more from Panama, from the tourism, more mm -hmm. from the tour, accessible tourism, uh, let's say, field. Mm -hmm. So if you so, have a question. <laughs> I'd love to know, uh, for those of you who are beginning to, or to, to, to welcome visitors, um, tourists, um, participants, whatever, uh, back uh, to your programs, your museums, your cultural institutions, um, or, or if you're planning to, um, are there um, are there particular um, solutions that you've um, that you've found to maintain accessibility, um, or or are there particular challenges that you weren't expecting um, regarding you know maintaining a, an inclusive environment? Um, when we have to be socially distant and, you know, touch is, um, you know, potentially problematic, um, transportation, you know, all with all of these challenges. So are there, are there kind of surprising things that have come up for you and have you come up with any, you know, 
aha <laughs> kind of solutions to any of these um, issues for any any audiences really i will note this question because i will also um spread it on uh on our social media channels because it, it would be interesting to know uh some answers so how are museums going to cope with the uh, keeping social mm -hmm. distancing for their inclusive and accessive activities, which involve a lot of contact. And uh, but uh, yeah. you're all invited to answer. I know that there, there's some shyness probably, but uh, <laughs> or, or some countries still haven't um, actually yeah. opened yes, uh, yes. or are working now on the same, on the same themes. So we're, we're all asking themselves the same question. Right. Still yeah. Come yeah. Up with an answer, apparently, because I'm not seeing a lot of a, a lot of movement there. I think this is a great forum. You know, the group of the group that are you know people who are participating in in these this series of webinars it would be a good you know resource for sharing as we as we progress. Yes, definitely. You know, we we have a a monthly. Um, conference call for accessible tour operators which is uh, always a good chance to ask questions to the mm -hmm. others and, and share best practices but um the the one the, um, the conferences you shared before uh, i will send in um, there will be an email at the end of the conference i will send right. to all the participants Thank with um, with your links so that people can uh, follow up and uh, and do some uh, we have one answer we have uh, Stefania Gandin from Italy, from Sardinia, and she, uh, accessibility issues are still undervalued in, uh, in the current situation, at least here in Italy. Yeah, the, it, it's, I wouldn't say just in Italy, the, the, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, one thing I, I, I noticed personally from, from my point of view was that um, accessibility went a bit at the end of the priorities uh, pile. Mm -hmm during the coronavirus cri crisis because everybody was a bit like completely focused on on other yeah. issues and accessibility and inclusion was the last uh, now it seems to be uh, kind of coming back as a priority because there's mm -hmm. also a lot of talk about that okay. but, um, yeah but i yes I think maybe I think too soon for your question. <laughs> yes. Well, I guess another quick question: if uh, if anyone has been um, reaching out to people with disabilities virtually um, through any kind of programming or um, resource that is inclusive, um, you know, is, is anyone um, connecting in that way with audiences? With disabilities let's see let's see what they say um, I don't know if any of the participants have already implemented ac accessible let's say inclusive museum activities I think Ana Maria from Panama I know that she was um, she's working with local museums doing some mm -hmm. activities, so I don't know if, uh, if she wants to chip in um, and for the rest uh, yes I, I think in a way um it's 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 a complex moment but i think the online um the online activities really have helped a lot and i was very um positively surprised when you said um but but of course it's yeah it, it should be like this when you said that uh doing your activities in uh, american sign language that you had more people follow them than you would normally have physically in the museum because of course it's 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 the language um it's a common language to people from all over the states and probably even from I, i'm guessing uh maybe maybe english sign you know the uk sign language is probably similar i'm i'm guessing I, I i do not know but um but yeah people from all over the states were able to to to, to take part and enjoy it because of the language and uh, mm -hmm. so you, you got more more fans <laughs> all over the states that's, that's great yeah. and we're actually starting to get um more people so the Me memory cafe um we we did the, the first time we did it we just sent an email to people who'd participated in Metascapes in the last six months or so, and that's, that was it. And then the next one, um, the Met uh, is sending out a, a weekly email to anyone on the email list who signed up on the website, 
just in, in general for programming, uh, kind of featuring virtual programs. And um, the Met Memory Cafe was the very first one on that email. And immediately we got people from all different states and, you know, uh, signing up. So also, you know, for, for that, population as well um, in, you know virtual programming can really extend your <laughs> expand your audience because we don't have to worry about the geography exactly no no in, in a way it's a, it's a wonderful consequence of a terrible situation but it's yeah. uh, I think all, yeah. all of us enjoyed I think some community life uh, that we were not normally doing mm -hmm. in life. Yeah, and um, I hope we can we can keep up, you know, the, the lessons that we learn uh, from um, the way we can reach people virtually. Um, once you know, we can we can we can complement in person experiences with these um, virtual ones um, in in future, certainly in the near term, but just in the long term as well. We've shown that people that we might not think um, would be able to or would want to connect in this way can and do. Yeah, yeah, that was my, that was, that was my, also one of my questions. Uh, are you going to keep some online activities uh, on afterwards also? Will they become, you know, a permanent uh, appointment also for when we can go out again? And mm. I wonder if they will still have the same success. I don't know. Maybe we've gotten used to all these online events and will we keep them up when... Uh, mm. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, we're definitely planning um, um, hybrid or blended um, types of, of programs. Uh, so uh, for once we, we reopen. Um, so uh, for example, um, I think programs for people with disabilities um, where um, people are, are often more vulnerable to the, the virus, we're going to be you know, especially cautious um, and we'll continue to have the gathering be virtual for a while, mm -hmm. but um, we'll um, supplement that with um, a, a prompt or kind of self-guided tour <laughs> um, that people could either come, you know, as an individual or as a family or as a you know person, a caregiver and person with dementia say um, to the museum if they want to on their own be socially distant um, and then they can gather um, on zoom or if they if they're if they're at home or if they're in another state um, they can they can do that same kind of preparation together on the museum's website so we have to think about making those prompts serve both functions um, and uh, and then you know bringing uh, bringing people together for a discussion <clears throat> excuse me a discussion continuing to do that virtually for a while and yeah maybe can, that will just continue not replacing on site programming but um, as a new additional way um, of reaching other audiences okay thank you. Um, Anna Maria was saying from Panama that they've launched um, last week uh, the first uh, a first um, collection of digital resources, uh, which is a downloadable catalog of um, uh, I think it's if I understand correctly documents and uh, resources for visual people with visual impairments or low vision and other for people with um, learning um, learning disabilities. So oh, wonderful! They, they're putting together these. Um, they put together these resources that people can download, and we will share the link. And um, the tourism authority also has created a section in their website for on recommendations for people for visitors with dementia in museums. So there are some. Um, they're putting oh. online some resources. They are. Um, they're doing a um, comprehensive work on making their their museums more accessible in Panama and. Uh, I know from That's Ana Maria really because she's working with um, with the local institutions to and museums to to do this. Mm -hmm. I know about a very funny uh, buttons museum that she showed us some time ago. That's amazing. Yes. I'm going to have to do some uh, research online and <laughs> look at these <laughs> things. <laughs> That's really good to know. 
Um, well, thank you, Anna Maria. But I think if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, we can thank you. And uh, yes, I think I think we are we are good to go. Rebecca, thank you, thank you again for 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 doing this. It was really really interesting and and such huge experience um, that that you're sharing with us. And uh, and this um, webinar will be uh, has been recorded and will be subtitled, and will be uh, made available also for uh, in the future um, as a video on demand. So so for those who weren't able to attend, I'm sure. Uh, there, there is a second chance to, to <laughs> benefit from this uh, wonderful lesson. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I, it's really been a, a pleasure and an honor to, to be here with, with everybody. And I hope everyone stays well and safe and um, that your work can continue in um, making culture and tourism inclusive of, of everyone. Don't forget. It's not oh, the icing; it's the eggs. <laughs> that, that's a great metaphor. It's uh, it, it's fundamental. Oh, we have sorry one one last uh, okay. message from Mike Schattenschneider from Stuttgart, who's saying we are trying to establish a program for differently able people, but most people are not living are now living at home, and transportation is not easy. Yes, mm. yes. But as you said, you do some programs also out of the museum. Yes. So sometimes you take the museum to people. We do. We, we uh, yes, our educators go, they take art supplies, they take, um, you know, a laptop and a little projector and, you know, show PowerPoint with works of art. So there can be discussion about the collection um, and art making, depending on, on the audience and the, the need. So yes, uh, we, we do that a lot. And um, yeah, that's a really important way um, to reach people. But if we are having to maintain social distance, you know, social distancing, I'm, I don't know when that will start up again. But what we can do is is virtually connect with a group of people. Um, so I, I, yeah, I would say if, if transportation and you know all these other barriers are just magnified right now, um, you know. I, I would encourage any museum to reach out virtually and um, you know connect with the audience or reconnect if it's a pre-existing audience and um, figure it out together. It's um, you know everyone is in this strange world and we're all figuring it out as we go. So don't be afraid afraid to just jump in and um, you know invite people to connect with you and find out what they're doing and how they're doing and what they would like from a museum at this, at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So this, this was the last question, like the one on the doorstep, you know, when you're about to leave your friend's yeah. house and then there's <laughs> <laughs> like, no, but I wanted to tell. <laughs> uh, so thanks again, Rebecca. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much for sharing. Thank you to all the participants for, uh, for, for connecting and um, look forward to, to, to following the, the MET, at least on Facebook, the MET Accessibility, the, your department uh, and, the, and your wonderful activities um, online uh, on your Facebook group. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you again. Good luck to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> bye. -bye. bye.